Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show today, we have uh, Timur Husnutinov, who is a uh, consultant in the uh, California cannabis industry. Good uh, to be here. Uh, and as well as James Just, who is the vice chair of the Sacramento LP. Welcome to the show. Thank we're you, on uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on uh, cable channels all over the place. So make sure that you tune in. Also on the web at www.accesssacramento.org. Uh, Trump got up in the middle of the night, I, I'm, I'm thinking Melania wasn't very friendly that night, and said, I am banning all, tweeted, I am tweeting a ban of all uh, travel to Cuba. What? What? <laughs> what, what, what is there to what say is, yeah, on what this is what? story? Yeah. Uh, what I can tell you is that there were several cruise ships from uh, Norwegian, Royal Caribbean, and uh, Carnival that had to essentially turn around uh, change the plans mid-transit and uh, reroute to the Bahamas, to other areas um, in that <coughs> region be because of this uh, late night sort of decision. Um, I, it probably will be reversed. I don't I understand it's, the rationale. It seems like virtue signaling to me and I'm not entirely sure What who. virtue? Yeah, I'm not entirely who he's virtue signaling Ooh, virtue. to, but I'm. But under normal presidents, I'd say, okay, there's something going on that we don't understand. There's some bit of information that we don't understand. On this, I don't know. It makes no sense. I think this is indicative of the age we live in now, where things don't need to make sense. Facts don't really matter. Uh, and then every other day you wake up and there's another news story like this. Um, I think it's just it's diversion from uh, the... Uh, the uh, investigations uh, going on and all of that. I think he's just trying to you know, control the news cycle and he's doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, of course, at the expense of people who are religious about going to Cuba for the, uh, for the experience of uh, you know, visiting the, uh, the, uh, the Soviet satellite. Uh, in, its, you know, in its declining years, I, I don't know. But you know, people that go to Cuba have a, you know, think it's a really cool thing. Uh, I've never been to Cuba, so I can't tell. Honestly, I didn't even know you could take a cruise line to Cuba. I didn't know well, what their well, no, Obama, were. No, Obama turned around the, uh, the long-term ban on travel to Cuba. It right, used to be the only way you could go to Cuba was if you made up a story about being in, you know, doing uh, journalistic work or scholarship work or some right. sort of, you know, some sort of uh, pseudo-nonsense. Now, if you buy a ticket, you can go to Cuba on a cruise ship or however. I thought it was just air, airline travel. but Well, obviously not. And, uh, I mean, cruise ships, several thousand people on these boats. They turn them around and show up at Freeport, Bahamas. Uh, they're going to be, be really welcome there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's so goofy. I don't even know. You know, you're stuck off going, I don't even know where to start analyzing this thing. It's just so out of left field. It takes a while just to kind of wrap your head around. I think, the they're, trying to, I think they're trying to keep us in. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the wall on the Mexican border to keep the, you know, people south of the border from coming in. I think it's to keep us from getting out. Uh, we likewise, need to, we need to spend our money domestically. Right? Li likewise, we're, <laughs> yeah. now, we're now looking at a uh, at a uh, uh, a visa policy. This is for people who are coming to the United States to spend their tourist money in the Grand Canyon and uh, you know the Empire State Building and uh, look at the Golden Gate Bridge. People who are coming to tour the United States are now having to give up their social media history, their passwords for, for not only their existing uh, uh, email account, but for every email account they've ever had. Uh, not in order passwords. To, in order to get a visa. Not passwords. Or just uh, username. Yeah, the, the username, the email accounts, social media profiles. They can even volunteer to give social media profile information that's not listed on there. Uh, different countries use different platforms. Facebook isn't used everywhere. Uh, as one example, um, but this is a huge change from how it was when I came to the country um, and when most people are used to traveling here to get the visa process. I mean, this, there were 65,000 people um, on the, the watch list, so to speak, to get extra layers of um, investigation and, and checking into their background uh, prior to this change. And now it's increased to uh, upwards of 14 million. 14, yeah, something like 14 million, something like that. And who's going to be checking all of that background information? Oh, well, the, pray the, tell. Yeah, the bureaucrats, of course. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna need to drastically expand uh, the uh, <laughs> State Department and other departments, ancillary. As departments. if anybody's actually ever, actually gonna look at all of that massive amount. They have of information. to. Yeah, right. It's the law now. Yeah. They just updated no, they all have, their forms. They, they have to submit it. Nobody right. says anybody has to actually look at it. Correct. Yeah, yeah that, that that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically just a, a wasted uh, much effort for people who want to come to the United States and spend their tourist money. 
It's, it's, now I'm planning some some you know world travel, and one of the th the uh, things I came up with, and I wanted to do the the Trans Siberian Railway. I know you might think that's that's perverse, but I actually want to do that. Yeah. I go across uh, Russia, go yeah. across Siberia, Mongolia, and so forth. I encourage you to. And I, I found out that in order to do it, I have to apply for a visa within three months of whenever I leave. Mm -hmm. In order to get that visa, I have to send my physical passport to uh, Russia or someplace, or to some travel agency someplace, mm -hmm. in order to get the visa back in a couple, three weeks. But I have to do it within the three-month window, and I'm going to be out of the country during that three-month window. So goodbye, Trans-Siberian Railway, unless they you know, make an exception for, for me. Uh, what I can say is uh, I never recommend sending your passport uh, pa passport into the Russian government. Uh, <laughs> I would think my, so. Uh, half of my family recently renewed our internal passports with Russia. I am a dual citizen, uh, so there's an external passport and an internal passport. So the internal one opens the, all the doors, essentially. Um, mine was issued relatively easily. I didn't have to send anything in. I went through a, a, um, a uh, travel agency, uh, a lady in San Francisco who's been doing this for many years. And within about three months, they processed it, and then they mailed me the new password to my home address. Now, when my mom did it, there was more issues. She had to actually come into, because they closed the consulate. Uh, uh, because, because the U.S. insisted on it. Right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, the, the consulate we would always go to in San Francisco and basically all the other consulates in, uh, on the West Coast. She had to meet twice with uh, diplomatic representatives in, Sac uh, in, in uh, Sacramento and San Francisco who rejected her, eventually forcing her to fly to New York for <coughs> one day, this actually happened, to get her paperwork processed. And only last week did she get her pass, uh, passport. This is uh, the entire process for her, for an internal passport. A dual citizen, a Soviet-born dual citizen, took over a year to do. My grandmother's was a little bit quicker, but now we have all successfully obtained our passports. However, like I said, never submit <laughs> your documentation to them. It's, the, it's essentially the same as visiting a country and having like a, uh, 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 FSB agent, which is the successor to the KGB, asking you to see your documents. You handing it to them, them putting it in the pocket, and you being screwed. Don't do it. Uh, Trans-Siberian Railway is, is wonderful, but it's not worth it to do that. <laughs> uh, okay, so what's the, I mean, what's the ostensible purpose of, of, of doing all of this? Is this going to... Data collection. Uh, data collection on what? Is this a terrorist threat? What's the excuse? Well, the excuse is a, is, a, is a terrorist threat, but you know it's it's just fundamentally more violations of our rights, uh, well, human right to privacy. Yeah. And, but you know it starts with people externally, and it's going to get to us. And pretty soon, you're going to have to submit all your information for you to leave the country. I mean, you're just talking about building a wall to leave the country. <laughs> it it starts with them. It's going to uh, the slippery slope will lead to us. And just because other countries will do the exact same the exact thing same in, thing in retribution. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, uh, well, uh, you know, the only answer, of course, is to become a libertarian. And now uh, Lincoln Chafee has become a libertarian. Uh, he moved to Wyoming. This was a former senator, and uh, he's been a Republican. He's been a, uh, a Democrat. He was a senator as a Democrat, I think, and uh, some other party. And an this independent. Is, he's bounced all this over is, the place. Yeah. Uh, so what do you make of that, James? Well, as a, I accept anybody who wants to come and join the libertarian family. It's, I warmly welcome anybody who, you know, if you change your mind, great, and you come and join the libertarian family, I'll welcome you with open arms. You know, but beyond that, you know, I welcome anybody with that type of experience because we can all, we need, the, we need the experience so those of us without it can learn. <clears throat> right? you, if you can't learn, if you don't have people with the experience to teach you. And so even if they got their experience from a different party or from a different ideological perspective, I still want to know it. I still want to learn what you've got. I can filter it through my own, through my own uh, internal filters and try to weed out the shaft. But I, you know, I need the experience, and we need the experience, and we need to learn from that. Do you, do you think that Lincoln Chaffee has any uh, any uh, political ambitions uh, now that he's in Wyoming, or is this just something he feels like doing? I think it's just something he feels like doing. I would hope he doesn't have any political political aspirations. He's not going to get any political support to run for office or anything from as a libertarian. Certainly but, not Wyoming. No. But he'll but he'll get support for, you know, he can help us become a more effective party. I guess so. I mean, I personally have issues uh, personally, not professionally, um, with individuals who flip-flop from one party to another now claiming uh, he recently claimed that no, I've been a libertarian the entire time. Um, 
fiscally conservative. Uh, well, I think liberal. we heard that from a Mr. Weld not too uh, long ago. Oh, everybody says that line, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's an easy e explainer. Um, do I take those words to heart for myself? Sure. Do I believe what Lincoln is saying? I don't know. Um, well, it's, as long as he doesn't besmirch the, the, um, the party in any kind of way, doesn't get into any kind of um, questionable behavior, I will generally accept him. Well, as long as he's not well. running for office. If he's going to be there and help us out and help us learn how to become more effective, then great, we welcome him. If he wants to say, hey, I want to take a leadership position, um, no, you haven't earned it. Maybe he's just really into Wyoming. Yeah. You know? He says he is. He says he likes Wyooming. He wants and property, absolutely, yeah. I mean, other than the winter, who would not? Sure. Hey, I like the high desert. It's good for my knees. Uh, <laughs> Democratic governor, or Colorado governor, uh, Jared Polis, has vetoed licensing of uh, a number of, well, the, the specific vetoes were homeowner association managers, genetic counselors, and sports agents. And I think that's fantastic. What do you think, James? Any occupational licensing that we can get rid of is a good thing. Um, it, we, it, in Colorado, he actually takes like 1,800 hours to become a barber, and a police officer is like 1,200. It literally takes more time to become a barber than a police officer in some places. It's absolutely insane. And we don't need to be protected from the rogue sports agents. I just don't think it's not the government's job to protect athletes from rogue sports agents. My question is, what's a genetic counselor? For, well, I'm, for I'm not CRISPR sure. Cas9 gene editing? For uh, uh, neo eugenics? I don't. I don't. I, is that a is that a significant enough group of people? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know enough about genetic counseling to. to I didn't actually... know there was such a thing until I read it in the news. Well, I, as, I assume it's about medical issues with people with genetic, with genetic medical issues, and someone can help you walk you through the issues. But wouldn't that be through a doctor or the actual? I don't. System? I don't know enough about genetics to actually. But I'm assuming. Fascinating. But I'm assuming. But you know, <laughs> politicians and bureaucrats aren't the people to be deciding who's right. who's qualified to walk you through that kind. And of thing. homeowner association managers. I happen to belong to a homeowner association, and the uh, people who aspire to become uh, the uh, like the president of the homeowners association are the people who have who don't have a life otherwise, who have nothing else to do and are willing to do the job that nobody else wants to do simply because they have time on their hands and somebody has twisted their arms. Why you would have to be, get a license in order to do that on top? I'm not sure. What's that saying? Uh, more paperwork always looks better. Um, I know some folks who just have stacks upon stacks of credentials and different kind of certificates and paperwork. Um, and I think in our society, it's valued generally more to show that you, you have completed something and that you can show it, uh, uh, the knowledge for it. But I agree with you on this point that I, don't, I didn't even know you, you could credential homeowner association managers. I thought you'd just become the manager. Uh, well, yeah, I, and okay, and sports agents. What? The, yeah, yeah but why are we? Pretty we need to protect from... Ali. What? I, I don't. I'm not even, even into sports, so. Nor am I, but I mean. But yeah, it was, why I mean, do athletes? I mean, I suppose you can make an argument that some young kid gets manipulated by a sports agent into signing a contract he shouldn't. Okay, but a government license isn't going to stop that. It's probably going to make it easier because mm, yeah. they'll, they'll have a monopoly situation. Right. Yes, they'll have the, the market will be limited. Okay, limited. I mean the, the basic the basic principle here, basic libertarian principle, is that anybody who wants to sell their services to a willing buyer should be able to do so. Right. Any uh, buyer who wants to engage somebody else to do a specific service should be able to. They should not have to get permission from a third party government bureauc bureaucrat. It's just as simple as that. It's, it's, it's a, an agreement between two entities, between a buyer and a seller. Anybody getting in the middle of it is nothing but meddlesome. I agree. And counterproductive and uneconomic and just not very fair. No, and you could get um, what, organizational. What, uh, organizations can... Credentials. Credentials. Yeah, yeah, just like, you know, the restaurant association will can go around and give this restaurant the, you know, an A grade or a B grade. Yeah, we've got whatever. a Michelin rated restaurant in, in Sacramento now. Yeah. Uh, Mich you know, the kitchen. It's, you know, and they deserve it. I, you know, they put on a, a, a good, uh, a good, uh, a good show and a good meal. Uh, and they, they deserve their Michelin one star or whatever they got. Uh, and but I It's would, a private rating. Of course, of course it's private. So is the underwriter's laboratory. They privately rate whether or not the, you know, plugging your appliance into the wall is going to electrocute you or not. And so as, as far as I know, they do a pretty good job. Not yeah. too many people are electrocuted by their toasters. 
So, uh, you know. And I, they're funded by the insurance industry because the insurance industry has wants the to make best sure that, interest to make sure they don't get wants, sued. Yeah, wants to make sure that houses don't burn down because of shorts yeah. and so forth. So it's really, really important to understand that businesses, generally speaking, don't want to kill or maim their customers. It's bad for business. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, getting rid of customers is just not, not very good business policy. So having a government agency, a government bureaucrat who is wet behind the ears and doesn't know a whole heck of a lot about whatever he's doing, other than he's got some power now, or she, is just somebody that's going to get in the way. Yeah, and fraud is already illegal. So if someone's committing fraud, you don't need special licenses and licensing boards to deal with that. It's, fraud is already illegal. You can either sue them or, or, or you, you know, fraud is a criminal offense in many cases. So there's there's are already options to deal with this. And I'm really, really happy to see that the person who is doing this in Colorado is a Democrat. Because quite often you see Democrats being on the highly regulatory, high, highly maternalistic, highly uh, paternalistic uh, side of, uh, of, of the issue, saying, you know, thinking that people can't take care of themselves, so it's the government's job to take care of themselves from cradle to grave and make sure that, you know, that uh, they don't, uh, you know, stumble or fall over a, a curb that's too high and so forth and so on. This reminds me of a recent development with Rahm Emanuel, former um, mayor of Chicago. Mayor of Chicago. If there's a good crisis, don't let it go to waste. Chief of staff of yeah. the Obama administration. Um, he recently joined a private firm, one of the most successful mergers and acquisition firms in New York, uh, in the East Coast, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, one of the new darlings of the Democratic Party, uh, tweeted, uh, and I quote, not all Democrats are the same. So in this case, this would be a positive interpretation of that quote. Um, in her case, she would be, she's condemning uh, an individual who's had success in politics going back to the private sector to make some money. So oh, she was, uh, she, that ways. was a disapproving tweet? Oh, absolutely. I see. You have to stick by you, your you, principles. You, you can't you work have, for all, Wall Street. Only baristas uh, are, is, uh, that's the only, the only oh, respectable no. occupation. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, unless you're Alexandria ocasio Cortez, Who is a barista. Right. Who was picked by central casting. Isn't she 29 years old? Yeah, she's something like 29. That. Yeah, and she literally was casted for that role. Yeah. They uh, literally casted her for the role. Yeah, uh, you know, a, a justice America. The justice Democrats. Yeah. Justice Democrats, you know, went out on a nationwide search looking for people who thought, who, you know, who agreed with their progressive idealism and who were photogenic and who could talk well. And she tried out. She got, she got the role and uh, ran for Congress with their support and, and won. Yeah. And uh, I can't remember. Quite who, literally auditioned for the job. I can't remember who said it, but somebody said, I, I, I can't remember. Some old timer Democrat said, you could be a bump on a log and win that race, like, talking about her Republican opponent in, in the Bronx. Not so much the, uh, the primary battle, but the, but the general election. You know, you, anybody could have won that. I'm just really delighted to see her and Nancy Pelosi feud so much over the, the direction of the Democratic Party. I, that's one of the more entertaining aspects. You know, I don't know. Have we talked about the Green New Deal on this show yet? Which is, there's nothing green about it. I haven't heard, the, I haven't heard us discuss the Green New Deal on the show it's yet. It's been but voted it, on. And, it's there's the, nothing green about it. It's all about minimum wage and, yeah. and uh, you, know, econo you know, Medicare for all and... Mm -hmm. And, and you know, a little bit in there about climate change to make it sound green, but most of it is you know the progressive economic agenda and nothing, you know, nothing else. It reminded me of a Soviet ten-year plan. Except there's twelve because the Earth's going to yes, die. Yes, but it, Earth, when I, when I, it the Earth is going to self-destruct in twelve <laughs> years. So it's, it, you're wrong. It's not a ten-year plan. It's a twelve-year plan. Twelve-year plan. <laughs> And there are, there are more along the lines of five-year plans. Soviets like to do things quickly, but inefficiently at the same time. <laughs> uh, surprise, surprise. Congress critters use three and a half times more language uh, in bills that is submitted by those who do fundraising for them than those who don't. In other words, we all know that congressman, uh, whoever, doesn't actually write his bill. Now, right. Even his staff doesn't <clears throat> actually write the bill. The bill is written by industry lobbyists who want the bill to read to their benefit. They submit it to the staff. The staff massages a little bit, and the uh, Congress critter takes credit for the bill. So the language is coming from the lobbying. Yeah. Uh, Thank goodness, industry. too. Can you imagine the, a worse set of cannabis regulations in the state of California if uh, yeah. the, the private sector and the ones actually involved in the industry didn't help write? And spearhead that? Oh my goodness! Yeah, but are funny. you doing fundraisers? Are you doing enough fundraisers to well, make sure know. that uh, your legislation is actually adop adopted? 
I don't think we need to for cannabis, but for a lot of other things, uh, I think that is necessary. The, the article was, was very interesting, um, and it's one of the <clears> first of its kind, barring the 1980s era research, which shows that, yeah, more political contributions and uh, more events and fundraising <laughs> does yield better results. And there's been some uh, uh, um, Ivy League school studies in the past 10 years or so that have shown that one dollar is worth more than one vote if you care to pay attention to that kind of stuff. Uh, but this was very... Well, also research to show that uh, a corporate <clears throat> contribution, a political contribution, not by the corporation, because of course that's illegal, but by but corporate executive, yeah, the, the return on investment of political contributions is phenomenal. It's just... It's just well, they wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't. No, no. I mean, if, I mean you know, you invest money to build a plant. ROI, right? Your, your, your <laughs> ROI might be, you know, 10-year payback or something like that. It's an immediate 100% payback uh, in, in politics in yeah. all the cases. Well, there was a little bit of a problem with her, with her methodology in the research. So it's kind of hard for me to take it at its face value because the way lobbying works is you don't actually have one group lobbying. You get a bunch of groups work together who write the bills, who write the language, and then submit them to their, to their connected networks. And then those connected networks, get that's how they get the vote. And so it's, it's a little disingenuous because it's not a single entity. It's groups of of lobbyists coalescing together to write the actual language. And so it's, it, it's a, I actually just had a conversation with a lobbyist this week about it, about, about how the Libertarian Party can start getting involved in lobbying. And, it's, and for, for him, he never mentioned money. He said it's about being, being there, making relationships, and building credibility. And so it's, it's about showing up. Of course, that's what he says. But it's, but it, well, he's a retired lobbyist, so it's a, you know, he doesn't care anymore. But it's, I mean, it's not that money doesn't help. Um, she did the... Money gets you in the door. Well, yeah, money always helps. But she did the Obamacare, which is a big, massive, huge thing. ACA. Yeah, well, the big, huge, massive whole thing. And rather than most bills are, you know, the library or funding for a freeway. Well, or, so it's, it's most federal bills are omnibus anymore. There's, you know, very few standalone bills, which is one of the problems with whatever comes out of... <laughs> out of Washington, you know, very very little is done uh, as a, uh, a, a you know a bill that you can vote on a single issue. That most of them are thrown together. You know, if, if you fund my bridge, I'll fund your yep. highway, and, and so on. It's it's it's, it's uh, this massive coalitions of, of different lobbyists working together to get this whole, and it's easier for them because they can pull so many different strings that you get coalitions of lobbyists can get the votes, to, can get the votes, and it's easier for them to do it in this big conglomeration of an omnibus bill than to get it done in 50 different, in 50 different smaller bills. So um, one of the biggest, you know, complaints about, uh, from, from the progressive left is that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Hillary Clinton inspired uh, Supreme Court Act, U.S. What the, what's the name of that thing? The uh, the uh, the campaign finance uh, uh, decision by the Supreme Court. United uh, Citizens United, yeah. Citizens, what? Citizens United. Yeah, Citizens United. Okay, that that is awful because it allows corporate money to come into uh, finance uh, in an indirect way. Is the fact that I mean, is that the problem? We're allowing too much money in politics, or is it the fact that politicians have too much control over what we do with our money? Well, the second one is where you got there. The politicians clearly have too much control. I want Pepsi arguing against soda taxes. So if Pepsi's going to spend money to argue to argue against having soda taxes passed, fine. They're doing. They're actually in my. They're doing my business. So I. So it's it's very difficult for me to go. Well, we need to get all business money out of politics, or all because or all um, union money out of politics, right? Because. It's the same thing. Unions are well, but on the other hand, if you if you if the American Hospital Association argues we need to have uh, federal approval of building a new hospital, which we do, if you want to build a new hospital, you have to run the gauntlet uh, of uh, getting permissions from all kinds of different authorities mm -hmm. before, in order to just provide another hospital in, in a in a given community, and the standard is that you have to prove there's a need. Prove there's a need. Prove a negative, basically. Which is damn near impossible. Right. Uh, the benefit there is the existing hospital doesn't have any competition, won't get any competition, is shielded from competition. That's why hospital bills, well, one of the many reasons why hospital bills are as ridiculously high as they are. So it works both ways. Yeah. It, well, in a sense, yeah, they've got you've got hospitals and other and other business entities have 
manage to manipulate the government to get their to protections. Give them, to give protections. them monopolies. So it, it's actually key for our for us to put elected officials in there who are going to be honest. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the ultimate solution, is to put politicians in office who will be actually be honest. Okay. So they go to Washington as honest, <laughs> as honest people. I know. How I'm long I just a straight face. I'm how, <laughs> how, long, how long does that last until they finally figure out that honest is not, I mean, look at guys like uh, Tom, Tom Massey and Justin Amash, who have figured out how to be honest, and, no, and Rand Paul, uh, Ron Paul for sure, these are guys who, are, who have been absolutely honest, absolutely straightforward in uh, doing what they see as their constitutional role. Don't take money from uh, special interests for the most part and do an extremely good job of articulating what they think should happen and don't get a damn thing passed because they're not willing to play the quid pro quo games. Voting on principle. Yeah, but even, even the, freedom, uh, the House Freedom Caucus that Justin Amash helped found um, has, has turned been, against him. Yeah, has so, turned against him on the uh, on the whole. His you know saying, well, there might be something in here that uh, could lead to uh, you know could justify an impeachment hearing. Well, then we need to send them more support. I mean, it's it's, it's well, that's ultimately, fine. Ultimately, it's up to us. It's citizens. We as citizens are the ones who actually ultimately own the government, and if we don't take control of it, the politicians will. Okay, <laughs> I'm just I'm just too busy working. Yeah, I know, but much you know, time that's to do why, which is the ultimate problem. It's, it is. It's the most ultimate problem. Most people, most people don't pay attention to politics because they're too busy. Because yeah. they're busy earning a living, providing for their kids, making sure the kids get to school right. on time, just doing what is, what needs to be done in order to survive in this complicated world that we live in. Yeah. And they don't really get interested in politics and still, until their ox gets gored, until something happens, like you. They you, fill in the wallet. You, you have you, you, this gig economy thing. Yeah, passed, gig economy. And, and that's going to cut into your, your, yeah. into your work schedule. It's going to cut into your uh, earning stream. It's Even gonna, more important, that's going to cut into my lifestyle. It's, that's, it's, it's more important to me than money. My lifestyle is actually more important to me than money. Yeah. And it's, it's going cause, it's gonna, it's gonna to cause problems for you. Yeah. It's, it's a win-lose. You lose, who wins? The people who win are probably unions that can uh, organize things like Uber and Lyft, or unions that can organize uh, food workers, unions that can, you know, that, that's one uh, mm -hmm. set of winners. Another winner are the people who are lucky enough to get that uh, entry-level job. A whole lot more people are not going to be able to get the entry-level job because the price has been set too high by minimum wage laws and such or apprenticeship laws or whatever. Yeah, or the, the people the people who just want to get an extra couple hours of work a week just so they can make some money for Christmas. Right. And Uber and Lyft have been uh, not profitable for some time now. Since the, since since the been, onset. Yeah, so yeah. that's strange. We'll uh, talk, we'll, we'll, we'll take a lift ride home and think about this. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the show for this week, Libertarian Common Point on the air at uh, www.accesssacramento.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Channel 17 and Cable Channels, and Sacramento and Cable Channels, all over the place. Thank you very much for being part of the show.